Tonight on Mark Latham's Outsiders, the left-wing journalist, a real lunatic, who wants to introduce into Australia's footy grand finals this weekend this disrespect of the anthem and the flag by the players kneeling, the division we've seen in the United States. We're also going to have a look at the Australian Army officer who's been totally humiliated by the madness of political correctness. We've got a great political panel with Peter Baldwin and Peter Crawford. Zeg's here in the studio to look at his wonderful cartoons. We've got the Outsiders Outhouse and the Left Lunatic of the Week. I'm coming to you in front of the Toowoomba Railway Station in southern Queensland. Such a wonderful Outsiders venue. It's a wonderful show coming up. Stay tuned. Trigger warning, trigger warning viewers, you've entered a very unsafe space. This is Mark Latham's Outsiders, Australia's most politically incorrect news and current affairs program. We don't have any of the controls, limitations or restrictions of the mainstream media. We give you the other side of the story unfiltered, all the information you need to make up your mind about the important issues facing Australia and the international community. So we give you nothing but straight talk, all important straight talk. We're in partnership with Rebel Media, so go to our website, marklathamsoutsiders.com. You'll see it there on the screen, marklathamsoutsiders.com. For all the Rebel Australia activities and campaigns, sign up, sign up your friends, everyone you know, get them involved. We really appreciate the fact that you're watching the show and giving us such tremendous support. Now, at the beginning of the program, I want to raise a couple of very important issues to show how divisive and unnecessary political correctness can be. Some of these lefties have absolutely lost the plot. We know out of the United States we saw the division of the statue debate and imbecilic Stan Grant in Australia from the far left ABC tried to bring all that division of the statue wars to Australia. So unnecessary, so divisive, trying to crap all over Australian history and rewrite it when we should be honouring our heroes from the past. And now it's happening again. The United States has got more division, more disrespect of their national symbols. The NFL footy players are kneeling instead of standing for their flag and the anthem at the beginning of matches. Let's look at some of the footage. Just moments ago in the first NFL game of the day in London, several players on the Jaguars and Ravens, they're playing each other, happened, it happened in London. They kneeled throughout the national anthem. You can see that there are visuals of, it looks like dozens of players in this game as it's happening. We're going to bring that to you next. Now, is there anything worse in politics, is there anything worse in a nation than disrespecting national symbols of unity like the flag, the anthem and the veterans? Those players should be ashamed of themselves. It's a football game, not a political protest. If you want to get involved in politics, join a party, run for office, seek democratic support. Instead of using your platform there as footy players to be involved in a divisive, disrespectful act of sabotage, really, against proper respect and honouring of anthem, flag and country. Now, having seen that in the United States and how bad it is, in Australia we've got our Rugby League and our AFL Grand Finals coming up this weekend and you'd have to ask the question, what sort of imbecile, what sort of idiot would want to introduce that problem into Australia? Well, here's the answer. His name is Andrew Webster from Fairfax Media. You can see there the article he's written earlier this week that the player protest should be applauded. This fool wants to applaud that stuff rather than condemning disrespect of flag, anthem and country. And he mounts an argument that's absolutely absurd. He writes in the Sydney Morning Herald on Tuesday of how two Storm NRL players, he names them Will Chambers and Josh Adokar, should be kneeling for the anthem. Now, we've got no evidence that Chambers and Adokar have got any politics or any interest at all. He's dumped these guys into it without even asking them. And for them to kneel during the anthem because they're indigenous would be disrespectful to our wonderful national song, but also disrespectful to the game itself. We want to watch the footy. Andrew Webster's a sports writer. Okay, we don't want to distract from the wonderful play we'll see on Sunday between the Storm and the Cowboys. We want to really honour and enjoy the players rather than have political protests woven into a sporting event so divisive, so unnecessary and so ridiculous for this idiot to dob in and, and put in two players, Will Chambers and Josh Adokar, who have never said anything about Indigenous issues. They've never said anything about their politics. 
And I'm sure just want to go out there on grand final day and play well, not be distracted by a political protest, distracting from their team's effort. They want to go out there and win the grand final. Who wouldn't? They don't need this sort of advice from a fool like Andrew Webster. And even worse, he goes on to write the protest. These guys uh, kneeling in the grand final should be about excessive rates of indigenous incarceration in Australia. The imprisonment rate is too high. Well, why is that, Andrew Webster? Why is that? Have you done any analysis? You're a sports writer. Have you actually looked at what's happening with Aboriginal rates of imprisonment in Australia? They've gone up as a proportion of the population because in Australia over the past decade, rates of crime against property have fallen. Property related crimes have fallen. Most indigenous crime is physical, it's violent, it's against each other, crimes against each other and it's a proportion of the national total. The indigenous uh, amount, the indigenous figure has gone up. It's gone up because they've been bashing each other. That's the reason why. If you want indigenous rates of incarceration to come down, Andrew Webster, get out to indigenous communities and tell the men there to stop bashing each other and bashing their women. Tell the men in those communities to do the right thing. Even better, instead of being a coward in the newspaper dobbing in these two NRL players, how about you get out there, gutless Andrew Webster, and stand between the men and the women and do something productive. Instead of promoting a shallow, symbolic, empty, divisive act on grand final day. I mean, this is just so irresponsible of this guy Webster to be promoting this notion and bringing the division to Australia. Boy, oh boy. He is the Stan Grant of the anthem debate, of the kneeling atrocity. And boy, oh boy, have we got troubles in Australia when mainstream media are printing that rubbish on the sports page. Imagine how bad the political pages are. So that's Andrew Webster dealt with. My second item is to look at the corrosive impact of political correctness. Now, you reckon uh, corporate Australia's got too much money? Well, you're absolutely right. They're rolling in money. If they can attend functions such as this, I want to bring up on screen a program format, seminars hosted by the Diversity Council of Australia. And you see this advertised on their website. The Diversity Council of Australia is uh, funded and hosted by various corporate entities around the country and it's chaired by David Morrison. Do you remember him? The Australian of the Year from 2016 who made a fool of himself by saying we shouldn't use the word guys in the workplace. Well this is the outfit that he um, chairs and they host these seminars. For two hours you get information about words at work, language policing, political correctness from David Morrison and his staff, words at work and you can pay two and a half thousand dollars for your two hours at the Diversity Council, or if you're a non-member, $3,600, that's $1,800 an hour. Now imagine what you get in terms of words at work. What sort of tutoring do you receive in forking out over $3,500 for a two-hour session at this organisation? Well, let's have a look at David Morrison in action from one of his video clips. Every day at work, there are hazards that you walk past without realising just how dangerous they are. <laughs> In every office, there are things that you shouldn't be exposed to for long periods of time. <sighs> because some things are just plain bad for you. I'm talking about the power of words. It's so pathetic, it's laughable, isn't it? Imagine being a corporation with so much money that you can afford thousands of dollars to send your staff to learn about dirty coffee cups and a sign, it's all wrong, it's all terrible, it's the end of the world. Your biggest corporate challenge is it says your mum doesn't work here and you've got to change it to mum and dad with that imbecile Morrison. I mean, it is laughable at one level, but it's also a sign of what's happened with corporate Australia. These outfits that have been pushing the diversity agenda haven't got enough competition. There's not enough market competition to drive down their profit levels and make them focus on efficiency and productivity and the things that really matter instead of political correctness and language policing and signing up for these expensive, useless, thoroughly ridiculous seminars with David Morrison. So outfits like uh, Telstra, Qantas, Australia Post in um, uh, monopoly and oligopoly markets, they need more competition because obviously they've got too much money if they can afford to go to these seminars. Hearing that it's wrong to use the word guys, everyone says guys, and it, it's not a sexist phrase. It, 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 if anything, it's become inclusive. It includes everyone in the workplace. So bloody what, David Morrison? You made a fool of yourself as Australian of the Year, and the stuff you're charging here for that rubbish is just as foolish. And even worse, it humiliates good people. Good people. Now, 
the Diversity Council of Australia hosted a debate about can't take the joke. You know all the stuff about two blondes walk into a bar, or three blondes walk into a bar, that's a really sexist, misogynistic joke. You can't say those things. You can't laugh anymore. You can't laugh anymore, according to David Morrison. All these words and jokes in the workplace are totally unacceptable. All their language policed out by a bloke who used to be head of the Australian Army. Well, here's the impact of political correctness on someone who was in one of these debates at the Diversity Council, Guy Musgrove, a warrant officer in the Australian Army. He's humiliated here by political correctness. Let's have a look. To educate your middle management is really a start point. Um, the strategy is great for your CEOs and the likes, but you need to have a really strong policy at middle management to be able to give back to the guys on the ground. Oh, sorry guys and gals on the ground. <laughs> oh no, I mean, you've got to feel sorry for him. He can't use the word guys, which includes his own name. It's so politically incorrect in Morrison land that poor old Guy Musgrove there, an officer in the Australian Army, can't use his own name in the context of saying guys. He's got to say guys and gals. It sounds like a musical. Now, it's laughable, but it's sad in that Guy, this guy, literally, is someone in the military who in time of war we'd want him out there killing our enemies, standing up as a strong man in the, in the Australian Defence Force. And there he is, so living in fear of words, not bullets or guns or the enemy, but words, the horrible, fearsome words that we can use. He's got to check himself and can't say guys, he's got to say guys and gals. Now, this poor guy, oh jeez. He really, really is an example of how political correctness diminishes people, diminishes people. And it's so typical in our society that people live in fear of words, saying the wrong thing, a couple of things out of place, a word, a phrase that's taken the wrong way. The truth is every single individual in our society owns their own language. They know what they mean. And I'm sure Guy Musgrove, when he said guys, meant everyone in the room, everyone in the workplace. And he didn't need to check himself. He didn't need to be scared of saying the wrong thing. So this is the impact of David Morrison and this kind of language policing. It diminishes good men and humiliates people who should otherwise be national heroes. We can do so much better than that. Now for the rest of the show, we've got our wonderful panel coming up. We've got Peter Baldwin and Peter Crawford, two lines of the Labor left, reformed, who can point out all the left-wing mistakes these days on freedom of speech and education reform. They're on our panel coming up next. Thanks for watching. Welcome back. And I've got to say, this segment really comes by popular demand. Because when Peter Baldwin and Peter Crawford appeared on the show a few months ago, we got such a tremendously positive impact to say, get those guys on again. Because as former champions of the Labor left faction, you've got some really good insights about issues like free speech and education. So let's start with that. Um, let's say welcome for coming back onto the show. But can I start with you, Peter Baldwin? Have you been surprised at the level of left-wing militancy in the same-sex marriage campaign? We've seen university students attacked for handing out no leaflets. We've seen a young lady lose her job in Canberra. They kicked Margaret Court out of a tennis club. They've tried to run Dr. Pansy Lay off the medical rolls. Have you been surprised by the level of bullying and intimidation? Well, no. Um, we, uh, we saw that uh, incident at Sydney University a few days ago where a, a group of Catholic students were handing out uh, it's okay to say no materials and uh, they uh, had their, you know, the food they were dishing out that was smeared on them and, um, you know, they were sprayed with red dyes and people were assaulted. I mean, the sad fact is that um, what would be surprising would, would be if that did not occur. Now, you know, the same-sex marriage debate, I mean, I'm pretty relaxed about it. I voted yes in, into the referendum question. I, I've got no problem with that. Um, but I think the, uh, the whole pattern of behaviour surrounding the attempts to suppress speech associated with it's been quite... Uh, appalling and it's not just a matter of you know uh, the predictable assaults on, on on groups or events where, where a contrary view is being put I mean we've got the notorious Cooper's beer uh, controversy where you had where Cooper's beer sponsored a, uh, 
a debate between a supporter and an opponent of same-sex marriage, and um, this, you know, actually embracing John Stuart Mill's old dictum that uh, he who knows only his own side of the case has a poor grasp of that. You know, the, the obvious proposition that you need to hear both sides of an argument in a, in a significant public controversy, that's just gone by the board. And um, uh, I also read about Lenore Taylor, the uh, editor of The Guardian, uh, Guardian Australia newspaper. And, and uh, she wrote a piece saying that um, they wouldn't be publishing any uh, ad articles advocating the no case because um, she'd looked at it and in her opinion there were no good arguments. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, you, so you, don't, you don't actually need to present the arguments and let people make their own form, their own opinion about it. Well, Julia that. Gillard uh, once had the argument that she was opposed to all forms of marriage <laughs> as a traditional patriarchal form of oppression in society. So apparently right. for Lenore Taylor, that view of Julia Gillard expressed in her memoirs is invalid and all you get from The Guardian is propaganda for the yes case. Yeah, yeah. but, but uh, the idea that a, a journalist can decide whether an argument in a major public controversy is valid and say, okay, well, we won't run a contrary, you know, the contrary. Well, in advance of the debate, someone can yeah. come up with the best uh, perspective ever for voting no, and it won't be reported in The Guardian. It's, sort of, it's a heavy anti-intellectualism, isn't it, Peter Crawford, that's now swept over the left? Yes, and it's not surprising when you look at what's going on in the schools, because uh, the schools are often, with all this related material in English courses, gives left-wing teachers and others, who are more naive types in the teaching profession, the chance to introduce into syllabuses a whole range of left-wing materials, even if they're not in the syllabuses themselves. For example, in English, when you study Wag the Dog, for example, which is a very brilliant film, David Manette, Dustin Hoffman, Robert De Niro acted in it in 1997, it just preceded the Clinton sex scandal. That film is in the HSC. Now, I don't think it should be because I don't think it's being studied as literature, it's being studied as cultural studies. But it allows, by itself, it's a brilliant film and would apply it to the nonsense about Trump and Russia at the moment, all this mm -hmm. way the US Congress has cooked up this huge, great phantasmagoria about Russia. but. The interesting thing about it is that the related material that are introduced with Wag the Dog by many teachers would be ABC extracts, Howard and Tampa, all those types of left-wing agenda items as related material. So you're getting all this related material in the schools and you're getting personal development courses taught, as we know, the LGBT agenda is penetrating mm. into the schools and so on. Mm. Yeah, gender fluidity. Now, Peter, you've been looking at some of the social media consequences of censorship, Google and YouTube in particular. What, what have you found and what can we do about it? Well, you're familiar with the case of the, the Google engineer, James DeMore. We had him on the uh, program. That's, oh, so you did. And, um, well, of course, just to recapitulate what happened to him, uh, he, he attended a meeting on diversity within the Google organisation and they were given a presentation and asked to provide their responses. This is of employees who are mm -hmm. attending this thing. And he did so in the form of a 10-page memo that um, didn't oppose inclusion and diversity, he just uh, argued that you know the aspiration to have, say, 50-50 uh, employee ratios in, in STEM fields might be unrealistic because of the fact that, according to considerable research, men have somewhat different mm. uh, preferences as to the kind of work they want to, to do compared to women. There's a greater tendency for men to want to work with things as distinct from people. Mm -hmm. And for saying that, so he, he responded to this call for, to express a view, and um, so basically what they did is they, they took that and, uh, you know, summarily fired him after he did it. Um, you know, I mean, it calls to mind the, um, uh, the uh, 100 Flowers campaign that took place in Maoist China in the late 1950s, where all the intellectuals were asked to come forward, be open-minded, state your view. And when they did, uh, after they'd done so, um, the ones who stated dissenting views were purged. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, this is the internal Flush culture of Google, but what is very sinister about this is that uh, companies like Google, I mean, in terms of the control of, uh, ability to control the flow of information, are, are almost, you know, through their subsidiary YouTube and so forth, it's 
It's almost unique in human history. Mm. I mean, they, they, they're, I doubt there ever been ever been such powerful companies in the whole history of humanity. And that it has that Google has an internal culture, which is so intolerant of dissenting views from the prevailing PC orthodoxy. It's very uh, disturbing, and it makes you wonder where things are going to trend in terms of how they control the flow of information to the wider public, the people they serve. And, um, you know, it's, it's, there are some disturbing indications about that already. We're seeing a pattern where, you know, YouTube channels and so on that seriously dissent from the PC orthodoxy. And I'm not talking about groups, channels where people are advocating violence or paedophilia or anything like that. There's pe people who say, uh, have concerns about Islam and, well, and want to have mm -hmm. a, a frank and open debate about Islam. They're finding themselves being penalised, and they have a delightful term for it in Google, that, that they can be placed in what they call an interstitial, which, Mean, which is a, a, a kind of a limbo state, right. while, where <laughs> the videos are still there, but uh, they're excluded from recommendations. They're, ex you know, right. they're so-called demonetised, yep. so people can't make money out of them. And, Basically, it's trying to put them into a little isolated box where, where, where you know, there's minimal potential to go viral. So the original theory was these big companies controlling the flow of information, it would be in their corporate interest to maximise the flow. They make more money, more information, more sites, more YouTube channels, more advertising. But it's become pretty clear on all these platforms, whether we're talking about uh, Google, YouTube or Facebook, that there is an inbuilt corporate left-wing bias. Now, what do we do about it? Because no one wants heavy government regulation of the internet. That's obviously inappropriate. But if you can't trust it in the hands of uh, these, uh, these corporations, what, what, what's the alternative? Well, uh, it's interesting. In the US, there's starting to be a debate about whether antitrust legislation or something analogous to it uh, should be investigated. Because it, Google's a, a, a de facto monopoly. I mean, it's not a strict monopoly. There are other video streaming outfits. but. I think the, uh, what is very important is that the, these cases be highlighted and, and they be shamed and, uh, you know, for, come to realise there is some sort of penalty for, for this sort of behaviour. I mean, for example, um, there's, a, there's a, an Amer a Canadian professor of psychology called Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. who uh, has become notorious because he, for disputing the validity of these attempts to force people to use particular We've also had him on the program. So. We have oh, all the rebels. Yeah. Anybody you <laughs> haven't heard of? Um, but, you know, one day he, he found his Google account was suddenly cancelled. Mm. And, and, and uh, not only did it deny him access to his uh, video, uh, vid YouTube videos, but, but all his email and everything, suddenly he couldn't access it. Now, they, they you know, after protest, they quickly restored it, but, you know, the fact that there's this arbitrary power to, to, uh, to shut off a, a stream of information or a particular opinion, I, I think is profoundly disturbing. And when you put the various arms of you know, uh, speech control and thought control together, at the one extremity you've got the violent attacks by the, these characters who style themselves as anti-fascists and anti -far. No sense of historical irony, these people. I mean, we, you know, people in black shirts and masks That's right. smashing up the meetings right. of, of, the, of their opponents. Um, you know, there's a certain analogy between what, what, went in, what went on in 1920s Italy and subsequently in Germany, but they don't seem to see that. I mean, they've got far more in common with genuine fascists than, than any of the people that they, uh, they're attacking. So you've got that on the streets. So th that's, the that's on the online. streets, and, um, and that's increasing, increasingly legitimised in academia. The, because according to current PC uh, academic theories, or at least some of them, uh, speech can be a, a form of violence. So if speech is a form of violence, that speech that offends or discomforts people, if that's violence, well, you know, they reason, uh, maybe violence is an appropriate response. And uh, there's a, a poll done recently on American college campuses that showed that 40% uh, of the students surveyed in this survey thought uh, suppressing particular views that made people uncomfortable mm. was legitimate. And 20% uh, included violence in, in, in the possible, uh, uh, as legitimate in order to achieve that end. I mean, this is just, you know, the, the old 
maxim in Western countries that free speech was a fundamental tenet. And in the US especially, where you've got the First Amendment, that, it's, it's just disturbing to see the way that that can be rendered a, a dead letter. Oh, look, Particularly it's, it's way <coughs> off the radar. With, with the Labor Party, it's just extraordinary because um, when I joined the Labor Party, it, people like Jack Ferguson were in, in the Council for Civil Liberties, which campaigned strongly against censorship of all sorts, uh, obscenity, blasphemy, sedition laws, very strongly. Now the Labor Party is a friend of the enemies of free speech with its attitude to 18C and racial vilification laws and so on, which can be used to torment anyone that has any sort of reasonable discussion about ethnicity, indigenous issues or whatever. Well, Peter, you've said that a lot of the problems are starting in the schools. We've got this report today on the front page of The Australian from the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, which is showing that the level of achievement in the basics of learning for the average Australian student is the equivalent of the very weakest Singaporean students. So yeah. we've, we've got this massive problem in education, attainment and scholarship. What can we do about I'd it? I'd like to know too, Mark, about the, we're not allowed to raise ethnicity, of course, in any sort of controversial way. But my impression as a school teacher was that Chinese students and East Asian students were so far ahead of everybody else that it wasn't funny in terms of conduct, in terms of focus, in terms of getting private tutoring, in terms of their parents insisting they be at the top of the class and not be mediocrities and so on. If we were to exclude the East Asian component of our population here, I would be horrified just how low we'd, we'd sunk. Oh, look at our selective schools. Yeah, yeah that point is true. Well, but what is it about the Asian learning model? Is it the respect for the teacher, that the teacher is central to what's happening in the classroom instead of all the disciplinary it, problems you've mentioned in Australia? Yeah, everything that's old fashioned is what I notice about Chinese students. They like the idea of somebody sitting beside them, teaching them logically and methodically. They like to get over the obstacles by uh, tutoring, by personal assistance. They sit quietly in class, they focus, they respect the teachers. When I transferred from a school which was all Aussies and I had to put up with terrible misbehavior, and then I moved to a school which were a large component of them, East Asians. Suddenly, my life became a dream. There was respect, right. there was focus, there was everything a teacher would ask for. It's just simply old-fashioned values, Mark. It's not any great need for any investigation of it or Gonski or all these things. What, you know, about, what about the proper teaching of Australian history? Because we've oh, just well, been through the statue wars, the debate about statues in Australia. What's happening in the schools? Well, that's utterly disgraceful what's happened there. Uh, there's been, since the early 1990s, an attempt to deracinate, to rip the culture and the, the pride and the optimism out of Australian history and in the schools. By, first of all, by making it anarchic and shambolic so that the in, t teachers can teach all sorts of different things around themes. So instead of a, an optimistic view, of one of the great achievements of human history was the first fleet that came here and set off one of the great societies of world history, modern Australian society, with its liberalism, its agriculture, its achievements in science, technology, and whatever, and tolerance. Instead of it being promoted like that, it's being promoted by many teachers, and even by the system as a whole, I would say, as a crime against the indigenous peoples. Now, there was that aspect to Australian history, of course, and it can't be ignored, but it is preposterous. That, we, we, that they're talking about knocking off Australia Day. That is a great day, the 26th of January. That is the beginning of a great civilization, of a great country, of a great nation for which we should be proud. We should be studying the explorations properly, logically, systematically, through textbooks. Mm. We should be going, moving forward from there and studying the rise of the trade union movement, of the, the Labor Party and what it stood for and tell the truth about it, how it was the party of white Australia but evolved into something else. Well, here at Rebel Australia, we're fighting hard to keep Australia Day on the 26th of January. It's Absolutely, thank goodness. Left thank lunacy goodness. that's out there, particularly at local government level. So we'll keep that up. Don't forget our campaign, actually. I'll bring up the website, saveaustraliaday.com. Very important to support that if you can, to uh, lend your name to it. And later in the year and early next year, we'll be running a campaign to keep Australia Day on the 26th of January. We're out of time, fellas. The two Peters, I want to thank you for coming in. Thanks for your contribution. And we'll be back in a short while with the great Zeg here in the studio to run through his cartoons of the week.
Welcome back to Mark Latham's Outsiders, where I'm joined by our cartoonist in residence, Zeg. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, mate. How have you been? Oh, cracking. Well, cracking this week indeed. Cracking. You've got two wonderful cartoons for us here. They're really, really excellent. Thank have you. a look at the first of them. I've got to say, I got a good chuckle out of this when I first saw it. It's a reflection on Bill Shorten's visit to Korea, <laughs> where he runs into the dreadful Kim Jong Un. Oh yes, there he is holding up, uh, holding up the Aussie news. Uh, you know, isn't uh, isn't bad news for him. He's uh, 20 polls uh, in a row in the lead. Look out, Malcolm. And he says, uh, as you can see, oh great leader, I'm the I will be the leader soon of Australia. Uh, my friends in the AW can make your Trump troubles go away. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have a million membership forms with me. Well, I love that uh, punchline there. He said that you're too short to be Dennis Rodman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bill Shorten. <laughs> that actually little does shorty. say something in Korean, by the way. Does it? Says, it? Get, yeah, it says, get out of my country, you little protrude. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. And your second one is on the other side of the political fence, Malcolm Turnbull, a rocket man himself. I never oh. knew Australia had a space program. What, what, what's, what well, are we doing? We soon will. Today? He's just announced it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I've just got him there uh, with an astronaut to be. Uh, not, su not surprised that we'll soon have a, uh, a space industry, but I am surprised that our PM wants to be an astronaut. He's out of here. Five North words. Korea. North Korea. <laughs> 20 bad poles. Absolutely. Rocket man Malcolm, good luck. Yep. He's going to leave his troubles behind. Well, thanks for those, Zeg. And now we've got the Outsiders Outhouse. Again, using Zeg's graphic there on, on the Thunderbox, the Outhouse, the place of ultimate freedom in Australia. Don't, forget, don't forget our new email address, mark.latham at rnnmail.com, where you can send in all the views. I love to get the correspondence, views about the show, views about the issues. And mm. the first item we've got is an update on something that we aired a while back. It comes from a viewer, an officer in the WA Police Force there, Western Australia, and he writes as follows. Just thought I'd give you an update on this. The dubious process for recruiting at a police station north of Perth was covered on your show with Alan Jones a few months ago. This is when there was a, what was really a female-only ad put out and we challenged the WA Police Force. They said it was an equitable process. Well, our viewer writes in, that it resulted in one applicant only. Yes, you guessed it, a female applicant got the job. So sad that an officer in charge position advertised in this way deters any capable male applicants from applying, which is clearly what's happened here. The thing that really pisses me off is that the WA police have broken the law under the Equal Opportunity Act 1984. Yep. That's, uh, that's probably right. We're supposed to uphold the law, yet here we are breaking it in the name of gender balance, oh. which indeed is pretty crook. And our second letter comes from my part of the world. It's James from Western Sydney University. And he writes as follows. My short amount of time as an undergraduate has been some of the most rage inducing in my life so far. I, for one, am sick of the Marxist indoctrination, misinformation and otherwise blatant lies being spewed by these liberal arts colleges and the professors who staff them. How she got a PhD, my lecturer, is beyond me. That just means to be an academic is simply to spin a narrative. Meritocracy is a myth. My ass, writes James, everything is a social construct, same thing. Postmodernist drivel aside, there are some truths in this world that are absolute. One of them being that meritocracy is the best system of management yet devised by mankind. And yes, I'm sticking with mankind because I'm so sick of being disempowered and treated as less than, owing to the fact that I'm a white, straight male. Join the club there, James. I will not have some dishonest upper middle class privilege pencil pusher tell me I have male privilege when I've worked bloody hard to get where I am. Good. Mark, I appreciate the work you do on Outsiders and the Rebel. However, what's required is boots on the ground, people like me to speak truth to power on these campuses and restore reason and common sense to the world of academia. That's why I'm determined to red pill as many people as I can and not capitulate to any of these politically correct autistic screechings that spawn from the dregs of academia postmodernism. Well, strong language, James, but good on you. We hope you've got a bucket load of red pills at the University of Western Sydney. You'll need them there under the so-called leadership of Barney Glover. It's an institution that's gone downhill, and hopefully you've got the power, the strength, and the determination to set them straight. Now, our final letter comes in from Anita in Sydney, and she writes as follows. Hi, Mark. I'm a woman born in Australia by Australian-born parents in the 1960s. As a woman, I was born with more rights than I have now. I was born equal in law to men. I was born with equal rights to education. Most importantly, I was born with freedom of speech and the right to vote. 
I was born with the right to choose to have a career, but I also had the right to marry and devote my life to homemaking and raising my children, confident that my husband would financially support me and that I lived in a society where it was possible for a wage earning man to provide a good life for a wife and family. Love your show, keep fighting the good fight. The ABC told me tonight that women in my age group are my, most likely to drink too much. So cheers. <laughs> good on you, Anita. I hope you had a couple. One for yourself, one for me, one for Zeg. Cheers, Anita, and thanks for writing in as to how women uh, beyond the elites, outsiders, actually see these issues of gender and opportunity in society. And then finally, we've got a graphic sent in by our friend Gay. The aptly named Gay has sent this in. It's a reminder of how language used to be open and free and usable. And remember when you could have a gay old time? That was the Flintstones, just yeah. sitting on a poof, the old footrest, with a tranny, transistor radio, sucking on a fag, cigarettes, and no one, no one was offended by having a gay old time with a poof tranny and sucking on a fag. Good on you, gay, the aptly known gay. That's a good reminder of how things used to be. Now, Zeg, we've got the highlight of every week, the left lunatic. Oh, and the yeah. nominees, of course, continue to roll in. It could have been Andrew Webster for wanting to bring US division to Australian sport. It could have been David Morrison for his ridiculous language policing around the word guys. <laughs> but instead, we've got someone who was pretty hard to beat, Astro Labe. Let's have a look at your drawing of Astro Labe. He's the notorious headbutter. And I've got to say, Zeg, you've really amassed a uh, rogues gallery there of crazy lefties, haven't you? Look at that, look at that wonderful display with Astro in the middle, with the headbutt band-aid on his skull. You know, mate, I don't even try to make them look ugly. There's something going on with the left. <laughs> God, God has not been kind to people with leftist thinking. I'll tell you what, though, mate, I've, I've drawn, drawn some of the, the most horrible people in the world. I've done thousands of caricatures. I looked into this guy's and he frightened me. I looked at this guy's eyes and he frightened me. There's something deeply dark going on with this bloke. And uh, you know, I'm not surprised. Um, I hope he gets uh, I hope he gets a few years in jail for that assault. Well, yeah, you can't go headbutting former prime ministers. You should be he shouldn't be headbutting anyone on the streets of Hobart. So Astro, we uh, ha think you're a deserving left lunatic of the week, but uh, more importantly, we think you should be spending some time with your left lunacy inside the clink. So let's see what happens with Astro. Thanks very much for joining us, Zeg. Thanks, mate. Thanks My to the uh, viewers of the program for tuning in and watching. We'll be back with uh, all the information you need, non-PC, unfiltered information on Mark Latham's Outsider, same time next week, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Thanks again.